Hello there. Crap. 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 You know, hey. guys sure are friendly, right? I'll probably never meet him. You might. There's something different about him. Had enough? What do you want? I'm busy. special about you you're nothing you will each be part of me and together we will be complete use the force let go the force is strong in this one don't think anymore i do the thinking around here You were really the brainchilds behind the story. Uh, how much did you guys look at the extended universe and the extremely large canon of books that have been written around the Star Wars universe when you decided to make this? Or was it more looking at Return of the Jedi and just figuring out how you guys feel it should have gone? Hey, you want to take it? Um, I think it had more to do with uh, Jedi and the continuation of, you know, four, five, and six. This is seven. Um, I think, you know, we were aware, we're respectful of the canon, but we really wanted to tell a story that interested us and delighted us, and we weren't, didn't really want any um, rules and parameters particularly. We just said, well, we can do anything we want with this story. What would be the most fun to, thing to do on this page and the next page and the page after that? And that was sort of the guiding principle, I think, more than the canon or anything that had come before. We have a vast and expansive timeline in the Star Wars mythology, spanning over 25,000 years of history in the galaxy, with each era being a rich resource for storytelling. We have a vast and expansive timeline in the Star Wars mythology, spanning over 25,000 years of history in the galaxy with each era being a rich resource for storytelling. Greetings programs. Welcome to the Not My Star Wars live stream. Star Wars episode eight. 
Original story treatment by Lawrence Kasdan and J.J. Abrams. It's quite interesting. Um, as usual, anything that Disney chose not to do is what they should have done. Unbelievable. Um, if you did not get a chance to see the video already, there is a video narrated by me that goes through the whole story, has images. So make sure you check that out. You could always come back to the stream, if anything, or hang out and watch it later. But you'll get a lot more context if you watch the video. Hello, D. Hello, Vicky Fabulous. First time here. Interesting. Glad you're here. Hope you have a good time. Uh, I try to be very open and interactive. So if you have any questions, comments, anything, please feel free. Um, well, it's um, like I said, it's like everything that Disney chooses <laughs> to do is the opposite of what they should do. It's really amazing how they scrapped so many of these ideas and uh, concepts and characters. And I mean, they had something. It, it really, I've seen so much evidence that in the very beginning, they were not only going to respect George Lucas and all the characters, Luke in particular, but really had a story. Um, and then at some point, I don't know if it was Bob Iger or Kathleen or somebody came in and just threw a wrench and they decided to turn the whole thing upside down and well, we see what we got. Um, so yeah, it's really something else. Um, yeah, let's take a, I'm going to take another, I'm going to count another 10 seconds just out of, uh, respect for David Prowse and Jeremy Bullock to really, um, not just Star Wars actors and characters but really two heavyweights boba fett and darth vader um we lost them both in about a week's time uh and it, it just amazing so i'm gonna throw up the picture i'll count out to 10 let's give every, everybody a quick let's give them a, a little shout out of respect and uh we'll keep going Okay, so yes, rest in peace to David Prowse and Jeremy Bullock, two giants of film, of Star Wars, uh, two really great guys. They were known to be very friendly and good people, did a lot of stuff for a lot of other people, and, um, you know, again, portraying two just amazing characters in the Star Wars franchise, Boba Fett and, and Darth Vader. Alrighty, so um, I send you a smile back, Vicky. Uh, again, thanks for being here. What a year it is! Yes, it, it sure is quite a year. Alrighty, so the script is thirteen pages. Uh, that's including like the cover and the little epilogue at the end. So it's really about ten pages of meat. I'm not going to read the whole thing out again because you can obviously see the video, but I'm going to skim through it. We'll touch on some points if you guys have any questions or anything. It's meant to be a pretty open conversation about it. Um, again, if you want to actually hear the script and see a video of it, it's there. The link to the video is in the description of this, as is the link to the original. Uh, it's not a script. It's a story treatment. So we'll take a look at it and talk about it. Just a second. All right, hopefully that will share properly. Okay, so the um, Based on characters created by George Lucas, all of Star Wars properties say that it has nothing to do with George Lucas, only that it's a part of the Star Wars franchise. Sometimes people misinterpret this, like um, the Clone Wars, all the episodes said, in, executive produced by George Lucas. George Lucas didn't have anything to do with Clone Wars after he only was in the first three seasons. Um, not only did he 
not having to do with it, but he had sold to Disney. So we all know that story. So sometimes you'll see, you know, stuff like executive produced or based on uh, by George Lucas, but it has nothing to do with Lucas. It's based on the old stuff. It's he was executive producer. I'm sure somewhere in the contract he signed that he was executive producer for all the clones, uh, the Clone Wars episodes. In any event, this was at least this draft was released April 5th of 2014. So this is obviously this is before The Force Awakens, never mind The Last Jedi. So this shows us again that they had somewhat of a plan, somewhat of a, a, a path. And then they just, for whatever reason, <laughs> I don't know, went off on some other thing. So, uh, let's see if it's going to let me skip images here. Yeah, good. All right. So, page one, act one. We see uh, Ray is basically on act two where she meets with Luke and gives him the lightsaber. So that was very much the same. Um, of course, Luke didn't throw his lightsaber away. You know, why he would do that, Ryan Johnson, nobody on this earth would think that Luke Skywalker would do that, except for you. So he meets with Ray. He says, uh, well, you're here now. This is where you were supposed to be this whole time. So... Um, not that in The Last Jedi or in the sequel trilogy, she didn't kind of have the same path to end up on the island, but it was more so she arrived there because of events that happened that that uh, got her there. You know, she got thrown into the mix. The First Order is attacking. The Resistance is scrambling. And so then she goes to find Luke. Whereas in this story, it's like she knew she was supposed to find Luke. There is a mention of Leia had sent her, but, you know, in a logical Star Wars story, um, we wouldn't have had to see all the nonsense of The Last Jedi. It would have been Leia from probably as soon as Han is killed, she would have said to Rey, hey, you got to go find my brother because this is getting serious and, you know, this is the only way we're going to fix this. So... Um, it's a bit of a different approach. Ray would have ended up on the island anyways, but more so because the Force willed it. She was supposed to be there. Whereas in The Last Jedi, it's all very contrived. And, you know, um, like all of the sequel trilogy, all these events are set up just to set up other events. It's not good story writing. It's just like, you know, mystery box, mystery box, MacGuffin, MacGuffin, this points to this. I took off my helmet on purpose because five minutes later, you're going to have to take off your helmet, Mandalorian. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, to the men in suits that brought more attention to what it takes to help create legends. To the men in suits that brought more attention to what it takes to create the legends. Yes, absolutely. Um... And again, Vicky, yes, what a year it has been. Fortunately, it's about to be over. Uh, we'll see what 2021 brings. I don't want to say it can't get worse because it actually could. But I suppose we're probably through the, the bulk of this thing. But then again, we got a new president coming in and there's going to be all new lockdowns and policies. And it's, it's probably going to be at least the first six months of 2021 are going to be a little bit all over the place. Anywho, um, so he explains to her how, you know, he knows about Han and that he just couldn't do anything because the island is too far out of reach. He only has so much influence. He can only do so much through the force. So um, also consider that Han isn't a force user. He's not force sensitive. So in a sense, he's like just a normal person, right? Whereas Ray is a very powerful force sensitive. So that will matter in a moment and we'll get to that. So Luke has a, a beautiful middle aged wife named Audra and two children, a little girl and a little boy, seven and eight. So that's nice that um, Luke isn't this angry, stupid hermit. You know, he's um, 
he did what we expected. You know, he created a family and is rebuilding the Jedi Order. Um, and, um, you know, even if he went to an island, uh, first of all, Yoda exiled himself to Dagobah, but it wasn't like he was punishing himself or he was um, in a bad place. He just knew that he had failed and he had to exile. But it wasn't like, you know, a self-condemnation like what Ryan Johnson did with Luke. Um, you know, he was on the island to refocus and reassess his life and to do other things, not to and to be away from kind of getting attention from the empire slash first order. So it's a logical reason for him to be on the island. It's not a problem ever that he was on the island. It's that he was a hermit asshole. That was the problem. I'm pretty open to all new ideas in general. Yeah, I am too. I'm a very uh, open-minded individual. Which is funny because um, I was just reading some comments on my Lucas video. And, uh, you know, there's so many idiots. So many idiots. You know, first of all, attacking George Lucas. And it's like, why are you here commenting on this video? Because of Star Wars. And you wouldn't have Star Wars if it wasn't for George Lucas. I mean, it's just amazing how pea-brained people are. Um, but you got all these people saying, you know... Um, He sucked. He didn't know what he was doing. Blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, wow. Anyways, part of why I mentioned that is uh, I took a shade on a great grandfather's grave last night. Okay. Ooh. Anyways, I mention it because. Some people seem to misunderstand not my Star Wars. Not my Star Wars isn't like um, I blindly believe or follow whatever George Lucas does, or just because it was George Lucas, it was good, and anything that's not is not good. Um, you know that kind of stuff has no bearing. I appreciate fine art, which was the original Star Wars movies. I don't appreciate trash, which is the Disney stuff. It's really pretty simple. It has no bias with anyone or anything. Um, it's just reality. Um, man, how bored are you, Rom Chillis? I feel sorry for you, dude. Anyways. And by the way, I'm winning because you're taking the time to come on my stream and comment, so... <laughs> it's funny. It's funny to me. People think that kind of stuff hurts my feelings. On the contrary, you're only helping my stream. You're only showing your true interest in Star Wars and what I'm saying because you're here taking the time. So chew on that. Uh, where are we? So Ray has a bunch of questions. She's inquisitively kind of picking up on stuff that Luke's saying almost as if, you know, um, she never heard it or knew it, but hearing it, she knows that it's true. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. So Ray and Audra check each other out. They regard each other. She introduces the kids. All right. And then she asks, um, are you staying for dinner? And Ray says, yes. So here she says the general your your sister General Leia. That's kind of weird, General Leia. Leia, General Organa, maybe, or General Solo. Anyways, uh sent me here to find you. You're needed back at the resistance. I'm here with R2 and Chewy, which is strange to me. Um the whole R2 thing is very strange to me. First of all, like they kept him under a tarp for three movies, which makes no sense whatsoever. But it's also strange because why would Luke not have R2? That was literally his droid. So if he went to the island, it just doesn't make any sense that he wouldn't have R2. Now, the one I've thought of this, and the one logical thing is that he wanted to leave R2 with Leia to help protect her and aid her. Um, you could kind of say, well, R2 is Leia's first, right? Because he's on the uh, Tantive Four, and 
they escaped down to Tatooine in the original Star Wars. So you could argue that R2 is basically Leia's, which is really Anakin's, which in reality R2 actually belongs to Padme. But um, I always thought it was strange. You know, why would Luke not have R2, especially since he flew his X-Wing to the island? It just uh, never made any sense. Did you see the Mandalorian last episode? Yes, I sure did. I watch all of them. Um, maybe we'll talk about it later. Later. So he saw that they landed. He knew they were there. Oh. And then this part is maybe the best part of this whole script. And it brings me back to the stream that I did. Um, the Mandalorian explain more? No, it didn't explain it. It just had Archie there. Which further makes a problem. Like, if he's there with Luke, why wouldn't he be there with Luke and Octo? It just... Um, okay, so this makes me think back to the... Um, why Ray is not a Mary Sue live stream. And had they executed this treatment, we could have avoided the whole Ray Mary Sue thing. But because they didn't bother to explain anything, show anything, give any kind of uh, context to Ray, of course, she's a Mary Sue. You can't, you, something that Disney uh, has just not gotten a grasp of and I feel like it's a little bit of envy of George Lucas because Lucas was a master of this, of like showing you stuff and some stuff you would have questions. It's not like he gave us details of everything, but the important stuff, like he gave you enough to understand what the hell is going on. Whereas Disney's like, we're not explaining anything. We're just going to like make the story. And if you want to understand anything, you got to read a book or a comic or a game. And that's just not how it works. Um, a lot of people don't even bother to see the movies. Probably three quarter of the three quarters of those people are never going to go buy a book or read a comic about this stuff. So it's just dumb. But anyways, if they had executed this, they would have really fixed the entire Ray problem. So Ray, J Ray on Jakku, your escape. Did you ever ask how an untrained pilot like you could suddenly fly the Falcon and outmaneuver those Tie Fighters? Then somehow rendezvous with Han and Chewie shortly after. Ray looks at him, puzzled. She ignites her saber. He charges her. They joist as they talk. You know how to pilot the Falcon, because I know how to pilot the Falcon. You beat Kylo on Star on Star Killer Bay on Star Killer because I was with you, adding your aiding your untrained mind. It's an old trick Jedi Masters use to help their Padawans. Okay, so we didn't ever know about that trick, but that's okay. That fits. That's makes sense. I wouldn't have had a problem with it. I don't think anybody would have had a problem that Ray's greatness, they could have showed her in the beginning being a bit of a Mary Sue. And you're like, what the hell? But then they could have cut to Luke from the island meditating. And you're like, oh, Luke is making her do this. And then not only is Luke the badass, now you've cured the Mary Sue and everything falls into place. But instead they just like chose to do none of this. They didn't explain it. They didn't do it. They didn't, they just, Hey, Ray can do everything. So achievement through trials and tribulations make good, solid characters. Yes, absolutely. They do. So, um, still they needed to show Ray training. They still needed to show her progress and her growth and, and arc and all that. This isn't going to wipe that away, but this would have been a key point to have put into the damn films. She does in this treatment do training, which is another thing. It's like you had the fact that Luke was channeling through her. Then you had scenes of her training and you chose to take those two arguably most important parts of the whole freaking her character and story. You took those out. So, uh, you know, you'll be able to be Kylo when you're ready. All right, so then she says, I felt the floor flowing through me like a giant gust of emotion and power pushing me beyond. Yes, Luke says, but I was the conduit. We cheated. 
All right. So that would have been really cool to have seen Luke channeling from a distance through Ray and truly showing his power um, and introducing Ray, you know, showing that she's obviously important if Luke is channeling through her. They could have tied all this stuff together so easily and neatly and explained all these problems. And we would have a whole different trilogy right now, a whole different thing with Star Wars. Uh, all right. So then she's like sparring with Luke. He knocks her down, of course, because he's way light years ahead of her in training. She would never have a chance. Um, and as she falls, she mentions, she mentions Snoke. So then he says, yes, I know about Snoke. We have history, which would have been interesting too. They, we have history, he says. So apparently they've met, fought something. Um, that would have been an interesting dynamic too. Like when you think about it, the sequel trilogy, there was absolutely no connection between Luke and Snoke. Probably, you know, um, the first half hour or hour of The Last Jedi, you're thinking, okay, Luke's going to confront Snoke at some point and or Kylo, but it was like they had no connection whatsoever. Whereas here they're saying they have history. All right. Uh, so he had this plan of drawing Kylo to the island because it's not about fighting Kylo. If you kill Kylo, the force is going to bring balance and create another dark force, another dark side user who he says may be more powerful. So he decides uh, wisely that the way to go about this is to draw Kylo to the island which was part of why Luke went to the island. Hello, Ryan Johnson. To lure Kylo to the island and then trap him there. I mean, this is so simple. It's so straightforward. And Ryan, like, it's not even that Ryan had nothing and he just had to create a story. I mean, he had this and he literally said, no, nope. scratch, scratch, scratch. I'm going to do this whole other stupid shit. So Hux isn't a little bitch in this. Um, he's actually, I mean, they don't talk about him too much, but he does seem to be under control and be a leader and have some authority. Um, he, they're still, they're searching. The first order is searching for Luke. They're trying to find the uh, hidden planet, the hidden island. So that's kind of the same. They would have shown Darth Vader's castle and Kylo in a back to tank healing in Darth Vader's castle. What the hell is wrong with you, Disney? <laughs> Who wouldn't want to have seen Darth Vader's freaking castle? You know, you make this big point of Kylo, like, oh, my grandfather, I'm like stalking your helmet and. I want to be you and this and that. And yet you could have had a whole scene of him in his freaking castle, healing, hearing Anakin's voice. Uh, I mean, you could have done. So in this, it's interesting because um, Force Awakens, Ray, um, like, hits... Kylo's eye, right? Like his face. And he's got that scar, which Ryan Johnson later moved and said he didn't, but then later he was busted. He moved it. So it's interesting because in Force Awakens, it was here on his right eye. In this story, he his face is messed up, but in particular, the left side, which I show an image of it, it's all this like biometal. And apparently he lost his left eye. So now he has like this fake eye that um, here is talking about this like droid, Medi-Droid swims up in the back to, and pops the eye in and sutures it into place. And, it, and it's now this, they describe it as a blue cataract looking eye. There's an image in the video, um, which that image in reality is labeled Anakin between light and dark. So that's the middle picture. There was a picture of more so Anakin normal, although like, Anakin Darth Vader, not Suit Vader. 
And then there was that middle picture and then one where he was like more so the Vader mask. But you can clearly see that that image, that um, concept art was part of the discussion of Kylo because it's his left side. He's got the biometal and the blue cataract eye. So you can see that they were juggling around all these ideas and concepts, even intertwining them between characters. And they had considered Anakin because there's the art. And, uh, you know, they ended up changing everything. So anyway, so Kylo's in the back to healing and then he gets dumped out. Um, I believe Snoke, yeah, Snoke's hologram, hologram uh, appears here and scolds him. So on Act 2, they got Ray, Chewie, and R2 eating dinner with Luke's family, which would have been nice to see. That You know, that was another thing, like, um, Last Jedi, you've got Chewie shows up, and, like, Luke says Chewie, but, like, they don't have this long hug or big conversation or anything. It's like, he comes in, kicks in the door to get Luke's attention, then he's like, you know, oh, okay, Chewie. And then it was like, that was it. Like, they had no more interaction. You see Chewie by himself later barbecuing a porg. Why weren't they all together? Like, So she enjoys the dinner. It's like a family she never had. Uh... And she's worried about Kylo coming to the planet. Luke says, there's nothing I can do about it. That's part of the plan that he comes and traps her traps kylo on the planet because again he could um get killed and there could be a new dark side user that could be even worse so um they claim here that acto was after order 66 this is where the surviving jedi came for safe haven many jedi lived and died here undetected and in peace away from the tyranny of the Empire. It's where the Force began and probably where it's all going to end. Okay, so that's interesting because, again, Order 66, all the Jedi died. That's like, that's been since at least uh, 2002. Okay, where we see, well, where do when we see, we see Order 66 and Sith, right? Okay, so what, 2005? We've known that all the Jedi die in Order 66. Hell, if you're an old school Star Wars fan, we've known this as well. So, this does change it a little bit. But at least this would make sense. That a few Jedi escaped... And rather than them all just disappearing and Ahsoka being a coward and all this, they all went to Octo with Luke. So then that, okay, you say, all right, well, that makes some sense that there were a few survivors and they all, um, you know, convened, if you will, on Acto. That makes a lot more sense because Acto is the home of the first Jedi Temple. It's not really, really Tython and and lore is but for the sake of the story they made acto the the site of the first jedi temple and also several others there's the second one is there as well so um while the order 66 thing is still a problem and it still breaks canon and ahsoka is a huge freaking problem at least if they would have done it this way from the very get-go that Yes, some sort of Jedi survived, and they all came here to Acto because this is the first Jedi Temple, and we're aware of each other, and we're talking, and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do, and we're going to bring back the the we're going to um bring up the young Jedi that we found. Okay, we all could have probably lived with that, and then it gives you the door to say Ahsoka survived, and we can bring her in. And therefore, it makes sense because later in this treatment, Ahsoka is there. But also, it makes sense for the rise of Skywalker, where we hear her Jedi ghost voice. Because remember that Ahsoka's not a Jedi. She walked away. She abandoned the Jedi. So she does not have, she has not passed the trials. She's not even a knight. She has no wisdom. She does not know how to be a force ghost or any of that. 
Now, had you done this, where all the Jedi immediately went to Acto, and that's why Luke later arrives on Acto because of orders uh, uh, after what he went through, and he would know about Order 66 because he knows about the Clone Wars now because he spoke to Obi and to Anakin and Anakin or Darth Vader, and he would have been convening with. Um, Anakin's Force Ghost, Yoda's Force Ghost, uh, Obi Wan's Force Ghost, and probably Qui Gon's Force Ghost. So now Luke would have all this context. He would know about Order sixty six, and furthermore, those Force Ghosts would have said, "Hey, you need to go to Octo, the first Jedi Temple." So now all of this stuff gets wrapped up nice and neat in a bow, and instead. They chose to do it totally. They just scrapped all this stuff that made sense. <laughs> okay. So anyways, here he's talking about after Order 66, how the Jedi went to Octo, and that would have made sense. And it would have fixed the Ahsoka problem. I still would not have been happy about it. Ahsoka died at Order 66, period. All the Jedi died. That is the point of Luke and A New Hope. But at least giving us half s of an explanation and not disrespecting Luke would have gone a lot farther with us than the bullshit that they did. That Ryan Johnson nonsense. So Hux is back on the siege, which the siege is a... It's not even a super Star Destroyer. It's like a mega super duper Star Destroyer. So obviously Hux has some authority and rank. He's obviously somebody important um, because he's always on the siege, assuming that is his ship. But there's no talk of, you know, Thrawn or someone else above him or um, I'm trying to remember the the old guy they brought in that was just the new Hux. In the Rise of Skywalker, um, such a worthless character. Nobody even probably remembers his name, but you know who I'm talking about—the older guy that replaced Hux. Uh, so there's not any kind of mention of any other other authority other than you know Kylo and Snoke. And furthermore, in this, Hux and Kylo don't really have any interaction. So it almost seems that Hux was reporting directly to Snoke as opposed to Kylo. And I believe it was The Last Jedi that does this. It might have been... It wasn't Rise. Was it Force Awakens? I don't think so. I think it was The Last Jedi, although it might have been Force Awakens. There's a scene... Yes, J uh, Pride. Admiral Pride or Captain Pride or whatever. Yes, that's who I'm thinking of, D. Thank you. Um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, there's a scene, I believe it's Last Jedi, where, if I remember correctly, Kylo goes in to talk to Snoke's hologram, hologram, and then Hux comes in like a minute later, or maybe vice versa, but I think Kylo is already there. And Hux doesn't like come in and really address Kylo or talk through Kylo to Snoke. It's like Hux just kind of like, is not really acknowledging Kylo and it's just talking directly to Snoke. So they do give you that impression. And this script does give you that impression too, or the story treatment um, that Hux had a more direct relationship with Snoke, as opposed to that kind of cut through Kylo thing, <sighs> which is kind of an interesting twist because Darth Vader was very much the hand of Sidious. Well, then again, Thrawn and, um, uh, oh, geez, how am I going blank on? <clears throat> uh, Tarkin, my lord. How am I forgetting Tarkin? <sighs> Tarkin and Thrawn in the EU more so implemented Sidious's military operations, right? Whereas Vader was very close to. Sidious per se. So I guess it's kind of the same how Kylo close to Snoke and then Hux was kind of like, you know, the instrument to run the, the military, if you will. Okay. Um, 
So they're in space. They find a big piece of junk, space junk, and then Poe and an X-Wing squadron come out from behind and kind of ambush uh, Hux. The point was to get BB-8, who's disguised, on board of the siege. I'm not against new droids. I'm not against... Uh, I think BB-8 is kind of lame, but whatever. Um, why why create a new robot? Why go through all that? Why not just send R2 in? Furthermore, you could just drop R2 off in space, and he could use his little feet rockets and fly on board. And we know R2 knows his way around and how to fix problems. I mean, R2 is literally the hero of all of Star Wars. So why do we need BB-8? It's like they were so desperate to create new things, but without any kind of thought to it. Like, we, we just need new droids because we need new droids, but you don't. So anyways, BB-8's on board. He's snooping around. Um, he finds some uh, droids doing calculations, and he reports to Leia. Leia tells him to um, upload fake coordinates to the Siege's Navi computer so that the First Order will go off somewhere else. Um, I mean, it's not a terrible plan, but it, to me, like, these Star Destroyers have thousands of crew, thousands of people of crew. Plus, you've got, like, commanders. Nobody notices that, like, you were going to Wichita, Kansas, but then all of a sudden the Navi computer says you're going to Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, it's just kind of weird to me. Like, you guys don't know where you're going or what direction you were headed. Or it's like the First Order is so lost all the time. I don't understand that, but okay. So BB-8 puts coordinates, sends them off to another sector in the, um, I believe it was the Unknown Region. I forget if they say here. Maybe not. Um, but basically, Leia sends Hux to a black hole. Okay, so we see Snoke convalescing on his home planet, Sacrum. Why didn't we get Sacrum? Why didn't we get to see Snoke on his home planet and get some backstory? Furthermore, what does this say right here? Listen carefully. Meanwhile, Snoke is convalescing on his home planet. Why? Because Snoke was not a freaking clown. Because Snoke was not supposed to die, Ryan Johnson. That's why we got Palpatine. Because at the last minute, JJ's like, oh shit, you killed Snoke. What am I going to do now? And they have the nerve to say, yeah, it was always in the plan. No, we all know that Palpatine was not in the plan. And right here, it's showing you in this original treatment that Snoke was on his home planet. You only have a home if you were born somewhere. Okay, not because you're a freaking clone. So all of this stuff is showing you, this is part of why I'm doing the stream, is to point these things out, is so that you guys see that there was not only somewhat of a plan before they scrapped it for the no plan, but that there was a little bit more logic to this. So anyways, Snoke was not a clone. He's in, uh, he is old. And um, very weak and feeble. So he isn't some sort of tank. Um, it says a gelatinous womb. It doesn't say Bacta, but you would assume so. And then he has some assistants to dress him and give him, um, where is it? Life-preserving medicines. Okay, so as he gets out, they introduce Doth and Nut. Now, I don't know if it's Dathan or Naut, or I'm just going by what seems logical to me, Death and Nut. The name, we don't know her. She's a made-up character, so it could be whatever, but uh, of Melody Origin, which I don't have any information on that. Um, she looks like Morticia Adams with heavy rosacea, so that's an interesting... And I wonder if that means she... Sh no, Wednesday is short. Morticia... Is tall, yeah. Okay, so was she sexy? Maybe. Um, I feel that Dath and Not was an adaptation of Darth Talon. 
And I did that stream that explained all of that with Darth Talon. So I think that, uh, again, as we know, that Talon was originally uh, at least discussed in the sequel trilogy. That's where they probably originally, originally Lucas had given to them at least one of the ideas of Maul and, and Talon. And then JJ adapted her to Doth and Not. That's my presumption. I don't know, but that's what it sounds like. Um, so she takes out a bunch of, um, Snoke's guards and he bows and applauds and, or smiles, whatever. Um, and then she gets in her ship, which looks like a maple leaf, which is interesting. Uh, you know, who knows? It might've been cool. The Prell, which I've looked up. There's no information on the Prell and she blasts off to go, um, Snoke says that he, she's ready to uh, advance her training, so then she's he sends her to Mustafar, where Kylo is in Vader's freaking castle, to keep an eye on him. Okay, so then back on Acto, uh, they're like walking around, and they reach a summit, and then Luke says, hey, here's the first Jedi Temple, which is the bell. Okay, this is a key point. Because um, I already knew some people were going to say it, and there's already one or two comments on my video of people saying, well, I think this is fake. Okay. Um, I didn't say this in the beginning. I cannot confirm that this is real. Someone could have years ago just written this up and posted it. Okay? So I can't say that this is officially from Lucasfilm. But I will tell you that 99% it probably is, and I'll tell you for several reasons. One, the paper. It's red. Disney and many studios do this on purpose so that you cannot photocopy the script, treatment, whatever. Okay, so this not being on white is very consistent with what studios do. Number two, the source that it came from is a guy that does IT and had worked, uh, did some contract work for a bad robot. He took actual images. These are photographs. I trimmed them. I don't know if you can see the edge. You can see the edge here. Okay. These are actual photographs. He got a hold of this stuff and took quick photographs of this stuff. So that's another reason, being that as they're photographs and not just like a written out thing, makes me want to believe it. Uh, I saw another copy of something else, which I'll be covering sometime soon, and that had a fold in it. So shows even more that this was something tangible. Um, the timing the story, the characters, as I showed you in the video, the images that coincide with the um, this treatment, which, by the way, none of those images, if you go back to watch that video, are intended to be one for one. Those images are from the art book, from unreleased leaks that I've found, um, the novel, all kinds of different sources I've got those images from, Duel of the Fates images, but as you can see, a lot of those images match up. Why? Because they were developing this stuff. They were talking about it. And when you have a treatment matching up with leaked images, that only proves to you that Lucasfilm was working on this stuff, at least on the most basic of concept levels. Now, the big kicker is the bell. Why? Because it was confirmed, I don't remember exactly when, maybe back in 2015-ish, it's been a few years. It was confirmed that in the very beginning, um, Lucas, in the very, very beginning, when he sold Star Wars, was involved as a consultant. They were talking to him a lot, and he was under the presumption they were going to do his sequel trilogy treatments. So in the very, very beginning, Lucas was involved. But as he said in several interviews... They told me they were going to do something else. And I just basically stepped away because if they're going to do, uh, I'm going to be in the way all the time. I'm going to be there telling them, you know, this, this, and this, that's not how it is. And I'll just be in the way. So he's like, I figure I'll just walk away from it. Okay. So what I'm getting at, the bell is confirmed that early on, Lucas was looking at concept art for, Episode 7 and the sequel trilogy, 
And one of the few pieces of art that he actually signed off on and gave his approval was the bell, the first Jedi temple on an island. I don't know if it was Acto, but the first Jedi temple on an island was the bell. So the fact that I know for a fact that Lucas approved the bell, and this is also confirmed by Lucasfilm themselves, okay? You combine that with what is here. They're talking about the bell, the first Jedi temple, and then I have the leaked art. You see two images of it in my video, the bell. So this, in fact, is real. Is it the first draft or the 18th draft? I don't know. Was it the only draft? I don't know. How much did they really, how seriously did they take it? How long did they look at it? How much did they take? Well, we know how much they took or not because we've seen the movies, at least most of us. But I can tell you with 99% certainty that this is real, that this is absolutely what they had written um, for episode eight. And again, there's, there's several reasons, but that bell is the, the, the catch. You have the confirmation from Lucas that he approved it, which is confirmed by Lucasfilm, which is confirmed by this treatment, which is confirmed by the two images of the bell that I show in the video. So this, in fact, is a true uh, treatment. Uh, 2005, yes. Pride, yes. Your comment about Hux being similar to that in TFA add to authenticity of this treatment. Yes. Star Wars, Ryan Johnson scrapped J.J. Abrams' episode 8 script. Yes. Um, and this is at least one rendition of that. I don't know how many other versions or, you know, if they actually wrote out an actual script or... But we know that minimum this existed and Ryan Johnson went and did completely the opposite of all of this. So not only did Ryan Johnson, like, totally fuck up Star Wars, has admitted that he doesn't care about the universe or canon or any of that, um, has well proven he knows nothing about Star Wars, <sighs> created a completely different and damaging story, but to make it all freaking worse, he had this, and he chose to just create that bullshit that he created. It wasn't even like he was influenced. Like Kathleen said, hey, here's the script. This is what it basically what The Last Jedi should be. No, it was Ryan Johnson on his own being like, ah, fuck that. I don't care about JJ's story or Star Wars. I'm just going to make some shit where Luke's a hermit. All right. So the Golden Temple, the bell. All right. The bell is the key. That's what gives this whole thing validity. And that's why I can tell you with 99% assuredness that this is absolutely real. I don't work at Lucasfilm. I don't know JJ personally. He didn't hand this to me. So I can't sit here and say that absolutely this is from the Lucas vault. I can't say that. But I've shown more than enough proof that this is what it is. Especially when you listen to the story, you see where all this stuff is coming from. And then you match that up with images, plus all the things that we've discussed in streams and seen around in articles. This is absolutely real. Some people are saying it's not real um, because, you know, people are just funny. They just want to find any way to discredit something just to say, well, that wasn't real. That wouldn't have happened anyways. What Ryan Johnson did is really what happened. Uh, you know, why? Because at the end of the day, there's people that don't want to admit like, holy shit, this was a lot better. And not that I'm going to get into Luke and the Mandalorian right now, but I just want to point out, Vicky, if you're still around, you got all these people right now. They're like, oh, my God, Luke Skywalker. Six months ago, you were the ones that were saying, fuck Luke Skywalker. He's much better as an angry hermit. And that's what Luke's supposed to be like. I like old grumpy Luke better. He's so much better this way. That's not Luke, the old Luke. This is the real Luke. And now you little fucking bitches are jumping back on and being like, oh, we got Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. Anyways, we'll discuss that later. Okay, so in the temple, Luke goes in and flips a hourglass, which is important.
Are you guys seeing these image these uh There's reported Kennedy's scratch seven to ten drafts. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, are you guys seeing these script pages or you're just seeing the the tiles? Is it sharing correctly? Let me check over here. No, I don't think it is. All pages laid out. Yeah, I don't know. Man, you know, StreamYard for the, the good things that it has, it really sometimes is a pain in the ass. <laughs> it doesn't always want to show you what I'm trying to show you. Let me see if I can get it to work here. Sorry about that, guys. I, I always intend to show you guys stuff, and then sometimes I notice throughout the scene, the, the, the stream, the stream yard is not showing the stuff the way I intend to. Um, I think that it should now show you this page that I'm on. And I again, I apologize. I <laughs> use the force, yes. <laughs> There's, of course, a delay, so I can't see it on my other laptop. Okay, there you go. You should be able to see it now. I'll try to be more conscious, and I guess I'm going to have to share page by page because it doesn't like to do it. All right. So Luke mentions that uh, – so Ray is like, you know, we're running out of time. we got to do something. And Luke's not like, no, actually, we have time. We have 90 sunsets. Um. So then he, you know, kind of calms her down and says, look, we've got this under control. It, it, not like The Last Jedi where she desperately goes there and is like, please, you got to train me and we need you and we don't know what's going on. And it was like, oh, disarray and Luke doesn't give a shit. And, you know, this is the complete opposite. She goes to where she's supposed to be. She meets up with Luke as she's supposed to. He's calm and cool. He's got his little wifey and family. He's chilling. And Ray's like, we got to do something. Leia sent me. We're in trouble. And he's like, Hold my beer, kid. We're okay. We've got 90 days. We're going to train, and we're going to get everything, all the ducks in a row for when Kylo comes. Don't worry. So we have 90 sunsets until imminent attack. When the last grain of sand falls to the bottom, if we're not on that beach, it'll be too late. Okay. So then Ray asks, how did you know about this? And he tells her. This island, this island was home to an ancient sect of four sensitive arch archivists, the Canid, which I, I seem to remember that name somewhere in EU right now. I didn't get a chance to look, go do any research on it, but I, that name rings a bell. Maybe I'm just thinking it does, but whatever. Um, and then he's showing her, like, on the walls are all these hieroglyphics of Jedis throughout the generations, all these stories and you know, information. And uh, she's like looking over the hieroglyphics and then she comes to this end point where she sees herself handing Luke the lightsaber. And she's like, what? You knew this? And he's like, yes, because they knew because the it was almost like a prophecy, right? That Ray was going to come to him on Acto at some point um, to fulfill, you know, this, this part of the saga where, you know, Kylo is, is being a problem. I wouldn't go as far as to say she's now the chosen one, but she's obviously somewhat important because she was in the hieroglyphics. And again, had they done this, had they shown us this, given us context and a story and built her arc and shown that she was somebody important, not the chosen one, not better or more important than Anakin, but someone of great importance because she's in the, uh, you know, the mythology. She's in the hieroglyphics. She's in the, the 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 records of the Jedi. Well, then it would have given Rey a lot more weight. We would have embraced her. But when you just throw her, and it's not about her being a girl. She could have been an alien. She could have been a robot. She could have been another dude. When you just throw a character in and like, well, I know how to do everything. I'm perfect. I'm better than you. And I don't need you. When before it was all about, I'm lost and confused. I get my arm cut off and I got to take my ass whipping and band with my friends and meet people and work together and 
build relationships and have a whole story so that we can defeat the Empire together. Well, when you take this route of just making Ray, you know, the bestest ever, it's not going to work. So anyways, Luke knew she was coming because this is part of a, I don't know, prophecy, but we could say prophecy somewhat. So then she sees a great, uh, she sees a picture of a great battle. Three Jedi against seven knights in black. She realizes this is the battle that Luke is talking about. And then she says, I see you and me, but who's the third combatant? And he's like, well, we're not the only four sensitives on this island. So that's interesting. Uh, she starts looking around. There's all kinds of weapons and armor and all kinds of things there. She finds a jetpack. For whatever reason, Ray is intrigued with the jetpack in this treatment. She's trying to play with it and use it. Um, I'm not sure really why. The point of that was maybe because they didn't have Mandalorian, so they wanted to do something with jetpacks. Um, this is obviously where they, they fly now came from because they had this story with the jetpack. Then they realized, well, wait a minute. We didn't make any Mandalorians, and we didn't use Ray with the jetpacks, so let's make these new stormtroopers with jetpacks and say they fly now, even though they've been flying since 1980, but they fly now, and we can sell some toys. J.J. Abrams is on record of saying, I hate that damn scene. He shook his head when it, it was created and that he was forced to make that scene for toys. He didn't even want that scene in the damn movie. So I'm the first one to tell you that J.J. is a hack and an idiot, but I will give him the credit of he knew that this that J they fly now. They always flew. That's old news. <sighs> Anywho, so she's playing with this jetpack, um, and then he tells her to kneel on this um, ornately decorated cushion in the center of the chamber, and then he puts a headdress on Ray, and he gives her a holocron, and she starts playing with it, and he's kind of explaining to her what the holocron is, and she, while she's touching it, she kind of flickers like a candle, like she's flickering in and out of existence. Uh, so then he talks about the journey and her journey and, um, it's unclear, unclear if Ray is seeing this or he's just kind of telling her this, maybe they would have shown a scene of it, but she's inside, a, she's sitting on a platinum throne inside of a great ac Acropolis. She wears lavish golden armor. Her eyes glow red. Uh, an explosion is heard, and half of the Acropolis blows out. The palace is attacked by Jedi Knights. She touches her hand to a nearby holocron, the same holocron. And then uh, Luke breaks the vision, and she's like, oh, well, that seems so real. And then Luke says, because it was 300 generations ago. So, all right, we'll get to that in a moment. I guess I'm going to have to reshare this, so just a second. Okay. So then now we're back on Mustafar again in Vader's freaking castle. <sighs> Kylo's looking at himself. He sees his reflection. He sees that he's like just a monster, just totally destroyed. Um, and here it says, Half his face is sutured in mecha tissue. His left eye is a cataract of blue film. He's become a monster. And if, again, you watch the video, you're going to see the image that I show of Kylo, which was a concept for Anakin. So he gets mad, breaks the mirror. Um, he sees his mask and outfit in the corner. Uh, and then he gets an intercom chirp that uh, the Nod has arrived. She comes in, um, talks to Kylo. She tells Kylo that she was sent to spy on him. And then he gives her new orders to go to Jakku to 
find the owner of the Millennium Falcon, Ankar Plutt. So it's interesting. Um, Kylo has an apprentice. That's Dotha Knot, which is Darth Maul having an apprentice, Darth Talon. Okay. You see where they're getting this from. Uh, I thought it was a little bit weird because it's the same problem I always had with Starkiller. I love the Force Unleashed game. I think Starkiller is a great character. Um, which, by the way, from the beginning, George Lucas said that it's not canon. Although that uh, it like glimpses it could be a secondary type of canon, but it's not official canon because, for example, he's pulling Star Destroyers out of the sky, which is nonsense. But it's the same problem I had with Starkiller. Darth Vader has an apprentice. Sidious doesn't know this. Sidious, that is so wise, so powerful in the Force, is in control of the Senate and the basically the entire Republic, and he doesn't know that Darth Vader has an apprentice. Furthermore, how much time would Darth Vader have been away from Palpatine? I don't know. Maybe they would not see each other for six months, a year at a time. But it seems strange to me that if you're an apprentice, you're not around your master. So it was always the same problem I had with Starkiller that how would Sidious not know? So how would Snoke not know that Kylo has Dotha not? Especially since, I mean, granted, the sequel trilogy is all nonsense, so it doesn't matter. But what we see in the sequel trilogy is that Snoke is very aware of Kylo's whereabouts, what he's doing. Um, he's the one that initiates the Force Skype stuff. So for Snoke to not know that Kylo had an apprentice, very strange. It's also very strange that he's the one that Force Skype connected them, knows all about Kylo, but yet when Kylo was turning the lightsaber and about to kill him in the throne room, Snoke was totally clueless. Anyways, that's called... I don't know what to write in my story, so I'm just going to make it convenient for things to happen. Written by Ryan Johnson. <sighs> okay, so they're going to go to Jakku and see about the whereabouts of the Millennium Falcon. Poe Finn and the X-Wings meet up with Leia and the Resistance. They're looking at charts. They're discussing their next plan, basically. Leia says the only way to um, the only way to beat the First Order is to lure Hux and his flagship Star Destroyer. Excuse me, the siege into the Black Hole's event horizon and push it in. Okay. I think that's all fine. It's a good plan. Uh, I have no problems with it. But the one problem I do have is the only way to beat the First Order is to lure Hux and his flagship Star Destroyer. So by the, di by the not dialogue, but like by the notes here, it's making it appear as if like Hux is great importance. He's like the top guy, like Thrawn or Tarkin, right? Like Snoke, Kylo and Hux. So, like the way that this is describing it is that he's very pivotal and very important because if you, she says, the only way to beat the First Order, not to kill Hux or take out a Star Destroyer, but to beat the First Order and destroy his flagship is to lure Hux uh, to the black hole. So, it's just an interesting thing that Hux seemed to have had a lot more weight, a lot more importance. And that if they took out Hux in the siege, maybe it wouldn't take out or destroy the entire First Order, but it's going to cause ma massive problems and disarray for them. That's clearly stated here. So, again, we went from Hux in the Force Awakens, like, speaking to thousands of troopers, like he's Hitler in front of a German army, right? He's got all these uh, troopers and equipment, and he's like, going on about how we're going to take over and rule. Then we go to The Last Jedi, where they're telling your mama jokes. He's getting slammed around by Snook's hologram. hologram uh, and basically, you know, treated like a little bitch throughout the rest of the movie. You know, Kylo 
makes them look foolish. Uh, I don't know. Again, I don't understand the disconnect with Ryan Johnson, where like you you literally have inverted completely all the characters. Hux was a strong character, and then you made him into this fool. So, anyways, they discuss the plan of getting Hux into the black hole. Uh, on Jakku, Death and Not and Two Knights of Ren wait in Ankar Plot's line. So they go to see Ankar Plot, find out about the um, Millennium Falcon's tracking device. He says he knows nothing about it, shuts his gate. Death and Not shuts the uh, slices, cuts up chunks of the, the um, his little stall or whatever barter station. She cuts up the wall and the thing crumbles and he falls out. And then, uh, magically, he has the tracking device for Millennium Falcon. So, anyways, back on Acto, um, we got Luke, Ray, and Chewie on the beach. Ray is fiddling around with the jetpack. They really make it a point of mentioning this jetpack on Ray quite a few times. So, it's interesting. It doesn't seem to be working. Luke snickers at her, which is, you know, that's Luke. Not that angry guy, that angry fool, you know. Him snickering at Ray. That's Luke. He focuses concentrated force energy onto the ocean, and then a giant pyramid ten stories high emerges from the roaring waves. And that's the second Jedi Temple, which I did put an image in the video. I can't say that that is the specific image of what they're saying here, but it was close enough. It's, it is a Jedi Temple that's a, a pyramid shape, so that's why I use that. Although I can't say that is officially the second Jedi Temple. I can, however, as I mentioned before, say that the bell was the first. Uh, okay, so a small door opens and Luke takes her inside. Let's go to the next image. Just one moment. Come on. Okay. So they train with staffs inside of the temple. Uh, Audra and the kids watch them from a distance, which I thought was a nice detail. Um, granted, obviously his, well, we don't know yet, but his kids are force sensitive. You would assume that. Audra, they don't mention any instance of her knowing the force or anything like that. Um, obviously she would know about it if she's married to Luke Skywalker, but there's no uh, indication that she has the force or uses it or whatever. But she is very much aware of it. So it's nice that the kids and her are there observing the training. They're part of it. Uh, Luke and Ray race on the beach. They finish, and he tells her to keep running to go to this go to this cove. He wants her to meet someone. A friend of his, I think he says at some point. Yeah, I want. he wants her to meet a friend of his alone. So she goes to this cove, jumps down, and this like Leviathan has these tentacles that come and wrap up Ray. In the video, I put an image of where that dark hole was in The Last Jedi on Acto, which is what I believe is where they got that from. Because she jumps down, and there's that cove. And that's where she gets sucked in. It goes into the water. So that's where that's literally where they got it from. It's right here. You know, this cove where it literally says, as she climbs over the rocks, she jumps down to a shady cove. Okay, so it's literally where they're taking that from. She gets wrapped up. She screams. Luke screams. And just then the, um, the monster is about to pull her under and then it freezes. And then we see Ahsoka. Ahsoka is using the force to calm the beast. Chewie then jumps out and shoots the beast in the head. The tentacles unwrap and Ray gets freed. And then Ahsoka explains to her, you know, you got to be careful because there's all kinds of living beasts on this island, especially those feeding their young. Uh, and then Ahsoka says that she's been living here for many years, free from the pressures of the galaxy. Okay. 
So going back to what I was saying earlier, Ahsoka is still a big freaking problem. But had they done this, and Luke from the beginning established, okay, well, the surviving Jedi from Order 66 came here. We've all convened. Many generations have been here. This is the first Jedi Temple, blah, 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 blah. Then, you know, okay, while not great, while it does break canon, at least it makes sense. At least we could say, all right, Ahsoka somehow survived, and the first thing she did was go seek out Luke Skywalker. Okay, we could probably live with that, because that makes sense. That's what she would have to do. Instead, we've got where Ahsoka was, well, she didn't exist. She was dead. But we'll play along and say that because she's in the Mandalorian, she was alive. And again, she was hiding out like a coward. She would have sought out Luke Skywalker and any other Jedi. Especially when she's telling Mando to take Grogu to a rock so that he can sit on the damn seeing stone and find other Jedi. Why wouldn't have Ahsoka done that herself? Because Dave Filoni doesn't think three steps ahead of himself. Dave Filoni only thinks, oh, I'm going to make this because it's cool. I'm not thinking about the ramifications of everything I did. And by the way, from the beginning of this, of this live stream, you saw Lawrence Kasdan doesn't care about canon either. Nor JJ, nor Ryan, nor KK. Nobody at Disney cares about canon. They've all, out of their mouths, said canon doesn't matter, including John Favreau. The seed streaks through the galaxy at light speed. Uh, let's see. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So they're, they're going through hyperspace. The siege comes out. And um, when they come out of hyperspace, Hux notices there's a black hole. So he's like, immediately, let's get out of here. Reverse the engines. Leia's flagship was following them. Uh, so was Finn and the uh, Poe Finn and the X-Wings, which, by the way, they mentioned several times Poe. Finn, and the X-Wing Squadron. So it's very much implying that Finn becomes an X-Wing pilot and part of Poe's crew. Because you don't have two people in an X-Wing and they keep mentioning the X-Wing Squadron. So Finn wouldn't be like a passenger or just there. I mean, he apparently was an X-Wing pilot in this. At least he had a job better than a janitor. Yeah. Okay, so then there's this female droid, CFIXI, which who knows what she looks like or what it is, but I guess they tried to have some humor here where CFIXI sees a resistance and is like, I'm out of here, gets in an escape pod and flies over to the resistance ship, breaks into the hull or clamps onto the hull, somehow gets in through an escape hatch and is like, I'm defecting. So then they put CFIXI in shackles and take her away. Droids and shackles. I don't know. That maybe an IG unit, but it's just kind of weird. Droids and shackles. Anywho, so they have that defector. Let's see. So you've got Captain Phasma and a battle, uh, a battalion of stormtroopers escape into hyperspace, um, which is interesting. Hux gets crushed by the black hole, but Phasma escapes for whatever reason, which Phasma wasn't at all mentioned or shown previously. So for her to all of a sudden be there and then escape and then Hux doesn't, it's kind of weird. I'm trying to remember in Force Awakens. How much do we see Phasma? Do we see her at the very beginning when Kylo takes, kills Lor Santeca? I don't remember right now. I know that Finn gets the blood on his mask and doesn't want to fight. I can't remember if Phasma was there. I want to say she was, but I'm not totally sure. Um... Shift 678. Hate this, no lie. I assume you mean this script? Um, well, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but this is 10,000 times better than The Last Jedi. 
Yeah, she's in the village. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of weird because you don't see her much in The Force Awakens. And then she's not mentioned at all in this until this point where she just escapes. So, I don't know. Phasma was always just kind of like a little side character, I guess. So, here it gets a little weird. Um, Leia gets taken to the droid, CFIXI, who had just defected, right, in the escape pod. And uh, tells Leia that she needs to dispatch a team to Sacrum because Snoke has a priceless artifact he's using as a secret weapon, which we don't know what that is or how it's working, but they mention it. Um, and then the point here, CFI XI says the artifact must be located and destroyed to ensure the safety of the New Republic, which again, we don't know what it is. And, um, CFI XI gives Leia the coordinates. And then she says, anyone that's going there has to have a special injection. And then she pulls this vial of blood out from her chassis and gives it to Leia. Leia is like, what is this? And then CFI XI says, artificially engineered Sith blood. Okay. This part right here is so J.J. Abrams. <laughs> this is another reason why this is real. Because it's totally the MacGuffin mystery box. <sighs> A droid out of nowhere is on an Imperial ship, sees the, uh, some X-Wings coming, decides to bail ship, goes to the Resistance. I give up. That very droid happens to have the location of Snoke's secret planet, plus information of what Snoke's doing, plus information about a very secret Sith artifact, plus has a vial of artificially engineered Sith blood, which I don't even know how you would do that because Sith blood, there's not lore of like there's Jedi blood and Sith blood. You're like Zabrak blood or human blood or Twi'lek blood, but Sith blood? I could see them getting a sample of a force user that has high midichlorians, like they're doing the Baby Yoda thing. That makes sense. But to say that it was actually Sith blood is very strange. But the bigger picture here is that this is a totally, this uh, paragraph here is a thousand percent JJ. Conveniently, this droid is going to defect, end up on the resistance ship, have all the information, the location for Snoke, tell the right person, Leia, and even have not just the details of what she needs to do, but then the blood so that they can go to the planet and get in undetected. I mean, it's just all oh, way too convenient. Uh, it's ST super blood all over again. Oh, yes. So Poe and the Resistance think the BB-8 was destroyed along with the siege, which I guess you could assume that. Although, you know, that's your droid, dude. Don't you have a signal, a homing beacon, something? Um, Phasma finds him aboard her ship. An evil BB-8 hacks his memory. And they find out now the location of Acto. So you've got... The convenience of the Imperial droid that defects and tells Leia where Sacrum is. Then two seconds later, Phasma conveniently finds BB-8, who was on the siege. I don't even know how he got on Phasma's ship, but we'll assume the Phasma and her ship were on the siege and she slipped out before they exploded. So that's why BB-8 was on it. We'll give them that. Um, but you got conveniently, here's where Snoke is and what he's doing. And then two seconds later... Oh, by the way, Phasma catches, captures BB-8, and they hack him, and now we know where Acto is. So it's <laughs> so stupid. Oh, man. So they throw him into a bunch of scrappy droids, uh, and as he fizzles out, he sends Poe a distress signal. 
Poe picks up the signal. They go after him. Uh, Leia hires some bounty hunters, which she orders uh, to travel to Sacrum and retrieve the artifact. Which, I mean, okay, but why don't you contact Luke? Or why don't you all go there? Or I don't know. I just think there's a smarter course than hiring some random bounty hunters to go up against Snoke on his home planet to retrieve an ancient Sith artifact. I, doesn't make much sense to me. But okay. They all get blood injections. Um, which is strange too. Like, If I take a drop of your blood or, I don't know, a little vial of your blood and I inject myself with it, Assuming I don't get sick or have some allergic reaction or whatever. Let's say everything's fine. Well, that's not going to change my blood. If someone later comes and takes my blood, it's not like your little vial of blood mixed in with all my blood is going to do anything. Just silly. <sighs> Anyways, they all get injections so that they can sneak onto the planet. Mm -hmm. Leia takes the fleet back to New Resistance Base to hide, while the others race to Acto in search of Rey and Luke. Okay, why wouldn't Leia go get Luke and then they figure out a way to either go to Sacrum and deal with Snoke, or Luke explains to Leia, well, part of why I'm here is to trap Kylo, which, by the way, is your son, and they don't mention that. I don't know that Kylo was originally... Han and Leia's son, by the way, because there's no mention of them having a connection or any of that. Um, not even Luke to Kylo. Kylo's just a bad guy. There's no kind of mention of nephew, son, family, blood, nothing. Uh, I just think it's strange. Now, maybe Leia knows Luke's plan from beforehand. He had advised her that I'm going to the planet to set a trap and to build my life, and to be around the Jedi Temple, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, maybe. But going from what we know, why isn't Leia going to find Luke, and they figure out this Snoke thing? Uh, back on Acto, Luke's kids awake Rey. Um, they're, they want to sing songs for her. Audra, um, Rey says how she really likes it, and they mentioned that she had been here for two months, so that's nice that they give you kind of a, a a perception of time and that she was there training the whole time. Okay, now this gives some weight to Ray that she'd been there on a the first Jedi Temple planet with Luke Skywalker training for two months. Now Ray becomes a little bit likable. Uh how about elite rebel commandos? Yeah. I mean either way, I just I don't know if that's the way to go about it. I, I just think if it's that serious that he's on Sacrum, why didn't you send like a whole fleet there or tell Luke or I don't know. I just feel like there's, they would have done more than send some five bounty hunters that are friendly to the resistance. Early drafts really referred to a Jedi killer, which eventually became Ben Solo. Yes, he was never Kylo. He was known as the Jedi killer, which obviously he, <laughs> can't beat a girl that picked up a lightsaber for the first time. So he obviously was not a Jedi killer. Um, he was, in fact, before he was Kylo or um, anything to do with Snoke, he was the Jedi killer. And in fact, for those that don't know, Kylo never was and is not a Sith. He was never a Sith. He was a dark side force user. And he was, again, known as the Jedi killer to begin with. But he was never a Sith. So that just goes to show um, that he didn't have the intelligence or the, the not the intelligence, but the, the experience and the, the wisdom of learning from a Sith, learning ancient teachings. He was just learning kind of like dark stuff from Snoke. Snoke was not a Sith either, which was another problem and the whole thing that they didn't explain. He's just some dark Force user. Uh, okay. So 
they give you some timeline that she'd been there for two months training, and then Audra hugs her. Um, they set up a bunch of traps along the beach for Kylo during that time. What a pain to have to reshare this every time. All right. So, again, they mentioned the jetpack. Ray is playing around with the jetpack. I don't know what this fascination is with jetpacks, but I guess that was their solution to not having Mandalorians and trying to have jetpacks in the movie. Apparently, Ahsoka finds one and is tinkering with it. I don't know why Ahsoka would be interested in a jetpack. And I don't know how we went from Ray playing with jetpacks to Ray floating in the air and flying, literally flying and levitating rocks and doing all this mess. Um, okay, anyways. Uh, Ray, Chewie, Ahsoka, and Luke plus family visit a misty Jedi graveyard. They hold a tiny memorial for Han Solo, which that could have taken all of 30 seconds, one minute of the film and would have been crucial. Why didn't Leia, why didn't we see Leia crying or have a moment or have a funeral or why didn't all these people get together? I, it's just befuddling. Like they totally disrespect Han Solo, throw him in down this like chasm and, uh, you know, he falls down that chasm on... Was it on Starkiller Base? Yeah, I guess so. And it's like, you know, oh, Han's gone, but nobody really cares because there's no memorial, headstone, nothing. Just the stupid dice that we see later. Anyways, it's nice that they have at least some sort of little memorial for him. Um... Luke tells Ray about one of the nearby graves, a mysterious ancient Sith witch, Mother Talzin, who turned into the, the light. Her name was Talston Light, or Lit, I don't know. I call her Light. But as you can see, this is where Mother Talzin comes from, from the Clone Wars. Sith Witch Talston. Okay, that's Mother Talzin. Ray sees Talston's palm print on her dirty headstone. Ray stares at it, inquisitive, she kneels down to touch it. Audra asks if Ray ever had a birthday, which she didn't. So then she has kind of her first birthday. Uh, and then here is Audra gives Ray a refashioned suit of, of uh, Luke's Return of the Jedi outfit. And there's images in the video of it. So again, we know that they were working on this because there's images of it. There's actual concept art of Ray in that Jedi in Luke's Return of the Jedi outfit. So. This, again, validifies this treatment. Snoke is all pissed off because of Hux and the story of the Black Hole defeat. All right. There's only a couple pages left here. So then you got Rey and Ahsoka hanging out. Presumably she's helping train Rey as well. They walk through the catacombs, the Jedi Temple. Um, Ahsoka tells her the story of Darth Vader and her time fighting in the Rebel Alliance, which is interesting. Ahsoka tells her the story of Darth Vader and her, Ahsoka's, time fighting in the Rebel Alliance. Okay? So, Again, we know that's bullshit. All the Jedi are dead in Order 66, and, and Ahsoka was never around in Star Wars. So it's still bullshit. It's still breaking canon, and you would have to uh, suspend Star Wars reality. But at least they're trying. At least they're saying that she went to the island and found Luke, and that she's been secluded there, and that she did, in fact, uh, fight in the Rebel Alliance. Although she didn't. I mean, no, she didn't. But at least they're trying to justify Ahsoka, as opposed to just throwing her in a Mandalorian and being like, hey, yeah, Ahsoka's here because, you know, I'm Dave Filoni and that's what I want. Uh, all of a sudden there's sounds from the bell. 
the bell, the Jedi Temple. Um, Ray looks, the hourglass still has a small amount of sand, but Luke says Kylo's found the planet, which I don't know, that was like out of nowhere where Kylo shows up. Um, which I guess Kylo gets there from the tracking device on the Millennium Falcon. I guess that's where they're how he arrives there. Um, so they, they go to the beach, they get ready. Kylo comes in as tie executor. Um, Datha not is sitting behind him, which I never knew that ship had two seats. Sounds strange. Maybe it was a different rendition of it. Um, TIE Fighters are always one-seaters. However, the Special Forces... The First Order Special Forces TIE Fighter is two Special Forces TIE Fighter pilots in there. Back-to-back. Back. So it's not to say that it's impossible. Just saying that, you know, we've never seen a TIE or TIE Advanced or the TIE Executor like that. It was always one seat. Anyways... Uh, they have two TIE Fighters flanking them, which are Knights of Ren, which, I don't know, Knights of Ren and TIE Fighters? I guess, whatever. Millennium Falcon goes out to try to, um, cut off their assault, which is R2 and Chewie, which is, which could have been a cool scene, too, you know? We see Chewie and R2 going off to, uh, you know, be like the first wave, the first line of defense in this storm of the beach. That would have been kind of, maybe kind of neat. Um, as an old Star Wars fan, we were always under the understanding that you need two people to fly the Falcon. Maybe not a hundred percent of the time. There was times where maybe they would switch out of the cockpit, but for the majority of the bulk of stuff, especially when they're like doing evasive maneuvers and hyperspace jumps and doing, you know, critical things, you needed two people in that cockpit. Now, when you're just in hyperspace already, or you're like just cruising like subspeed through space. Yeah, Chewie could go in the back and take a nap while Han ran things or vice versa. That was never an issue. But when you're really intense in the in the Falcon, you always needed two pilots. So again, here there's they're making it like Chewie can just fly by himself, which not to say that he couldn't, just saying. Um and it's interesting because it was R2 and Chewie going out to start that first wave. And that I think that would have been a cool scene. Chewie and R2, that's like a combination we never saw, like an isolated little thing they could have had a moment, which would have been neat. Because, you know, while they don't directly talk and they don't have, you know, obviously Chewie has love for R2 and vice versa. I mean, they were, went through all this stuff together. So, anyways. Uh, let's see here. Okay, next page, and we're just about done. So then uh, Chewie shoots off Kylo's wings. Not wing, but it says blow, blast Kylo's wings plural, off, and his executor crash lands into the surf. All right, so that's very different, obviously, from Ray flipping over a freaking TIE fighter and chopping it in half. Um, and the other problem with that scene is that he then goes spiraling, hits the ground, goes barreling into this big fireball explosion, and then two seconds later, he walks out. No helmet, not a scratch, no burnt or, like, crooked ripped or anything closed. He's just like perfectly normal, walks out of the storm, the TIE fighter like it's nothing. Whereas having his wind, wings clipped and then he falls in and he crashes into the surf, okay, that makes a little more sense. Anyways. So Ray and Ahsoka fight um, Kylo and Death and Not, which might have been cool. Kylo fights up to the edge of the cliff. Uh, Ray is there. She fights. Apparently she falls off or jumps off. Let's see. Uh, she jumps off, lands on the Falcon. 
she's um, on top of the Falcon, and Kylo's running towards the bell. She sends a bunch of rocks onto him, which he um, kind of deflects. Says he tries to deflect. I don't know that he does or not. Knights of Ren are on the other side of the beach. They um, Luke is there and dispatches of them, which would have been very cool to see. Luke just thrashing these Knights of Ren. Um, he chases one of them down to, I don't know if it's the same cove down the beach until he jumps over the rocks. It looks like it's the same creature cove, the Leviathan, and the Leviathan grabs one of that last night of Ren that's trying to escape. Okay, so Ahsoka and Dotha not are dueling, which would have probably been pretty cool to see. Uh, Kylo's getting closer to the bell, and then Rey is... Um, she sees him, and then she gets shot at by another TIE fighter. She then jumps in the air, deflects the TIE fighter bolts, which I don't know. That, I don't know about deflecting TIE fighter bolts with their lightsaber, but okay. Jumps onto the roof and then cuts the wing off of um, that TIE fighter from above. Okay, that's more believable that she from a cliff or the Falcon jumped onto a TIE fighter and while she's on it, cut the wing. As opposed to, you're running in sand, judging the speed of a custom TIE fighter blaring at you. You jump up and flip over it and cut the wing while you're upside down. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yoda wouldn't be able to do that, but yet Ray is doing that. Whatever. Um, there's a part here. Yeah, she lands on top of the TIE fighter and slices its wings off. It spirals out of control. And then she falls on top of the Millennium Falcon again. Very convenient. She regains her footing. And there's a point here where he, all right, she tries to use the, the jetpack, but it was damaged when she fell. So instead, she's like surfing on top of the Millennium Falcon. Uh, she tells Chewie to get her to the bell because Kylo's getting there. He flies her over. And he goes inside just as, as she's arriving, and she goes in after him. They meet up. They start fighting. Uh, then you cut back to the beach. Ahsoka beats Dotha Knot, knocking her unconscious and hanging her upside down with a rope. Which, if you just saw Mandalorian a few episodes ago with Ahsoka, Ahsoka um, ties up the Mandalorian jumps over like a tree branch, I guess it is, with a rope and pulls Mandalorian up on... on. Actually, I think what it is, is... I'm mistaken. Mando shoots Ahsoka with his uh, grappling cable. Ahsoka's like, yeah, right. Jumps over a tree, pulls Mando by his cable, and then he detaches right and falls. But same basic concept. So we know where Dave Filoni, phony Filoni baloney, Got his little Ahsoka over the tree with the rope. Is right here. Knocking her unconscious and hanging her upside down with a rope. Okay. That's literally where Phony Filoni got it. All right. Just a second. Let me switch pages. Okay, so this is interesting, too. Um, Captain Phasma's ship reaches Acto. Why? I don't know. She was with Hux in the siege at the Black Hole. She's not with Snoke, who figures out... Oh, okay, true, because Captain Phasma's BB-8 hacked regular BB-8 to get the coordinates. Okay, so I correct. I'm correcting myself here. She would know where Octo is. What is interesting, though, is she gets there and she aims her ventral cannon towards Luke's island just as they are about to decimate it 
Poe, Finn, and their squadron of X-Wings come out of hyperspace. So, first of all, we never see Captain Phasma have a ship. Not that I remember. Not that it would be so strange. I mean, you would think if she's a captain, she would have a ship. But we never see it. And apparently this ship, what is it? Has, it has one of these, the Rise of Skywalker, Death Star cannons mounted to it. It's like every vehicle now in the First Order has these planet-destroying cannons on it. So I'm just, I'm trying to understand why, like we went through half this movie, or the sequel trilogy, when all Palpatine had to do was secretly, without telling everybody on Fortnite that he's back, secretly have his Star Destroyers fly out of the Exegol, because, you know, they had huge problems where they can't just fly up. <laughs> so he, with time and secrecy, gets the Star Destroyers off of Exegol and just dispatches them around the galaxy. And if he's got Star Destroyers that all can blow up planets, then all you do is you post Star Destroyers all over different points of the inner and outer rim, and you've got control of everything because you can just blow up planets. Like, why do we even have to go through these entire movies when even Captain Phasma has a ventral cannon that was about to just decimate Octo and towards the island, just about to decimate it? Okay, well, it looks like they're saying decimate the island as opposed to the planet, but still, that's a pretty powerful <laughs> cannon if it's going to take out the entire island. <coughs> I mean, even the ships are overpowered in, in Disney. It's just crazy. There's, Here's the point. There's no stakes. If all the ships can just blow up shit, then what's the point of fighting? What's the point of doing anything? Because you can build ships to blow up planets. That's why the, the Death Star was important and a major crippling blow because they went from... We can do whatever we want. We can evaporate planets. You have to do what we say to, oh, shit, that thing just got blown up, and now we have no leverage. We have nothing. Like, people are laughing at them because not only do you not have your weapon left, but it was easily destroyed by a little group of 30 rebels and broken up, beat up old X-Wings. That creates stakes when you have a, a, a moon that can destroy planets as opposed to entire armadas that can just take out planets, well, then what's the point of this whole story? You just, again, park them around the universe, or around the galaxy. <sighs> Hello. I am Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hello there, Obi-Wan. Uh, okay, so then BB-8 somehow... Drops out on his exhaust shaft and is picked up by Poe. So this brings up several questions. Earlier they hacked him and he fizzled out and he was thrown amongst junk. All of a sudden now he's back to life and he manages to find his way to an exhaust shaft and get in the shaft, escape through the shaft, and end up outside in space. But okay, it's Disney, you know, shh, shh, shh. Don't ask questions. He picked it up. He's picked up by Poe. And then they fly down to Acto. Okay, so I'm trying to picture this. Here's Phasma. Big gun. Here's the island. They're in space. BB-8 somehow finds his way to get out into space. Poe, Finn, and all these X-Wings show up. Phasma doesn't see them. Phasma doesn't attack or defend or care. She doesn't see them. They come. They pick up BB-8. Nobody knows that BB-8 is back activated or escaped from Phasma's ship. Yet Poe sees him, picks him up, and then right in front of Phasma flies down to the island that Phasma's about to blow up. Why wouldn't they fight Phasma? Again, JJ, Disney, Filoni, all these people, they, they don't think ahead. They're only thinking about the moment. This will be cool, but they're not thinking about what consequences their actions have. If she's about to blow up the freaking island, why isn't Poe and them engaging her? 
They bombard our ship with proton torpedoes and laser fire, crippling it. Okay. I take that back. They do bombard her. Why wouldn't you destroy it? Why wouldn't you capture her? You just leave her in space. Anyways, BB-8, who's deactivated somehow, escapes into a sh uh, an exhaust shaft. Whatever. They fly down to Acto. Back to the bell. Ray and Kylo fight like two cats in a bag. Kylo disarms Ray. Uh, imagine that. Lying in the center of the meditation chamber. Shh. Um, she then cradles the holocron for dear life. It begins to glow and steam. Where did the holocron come from? Did Luke just leave a holocron laying on the floor from earlier? Two months earlier? I mean, they're in the temple. Maybe there's a holocron on the shelf or a few of them around. But it just, it's again, it's very convenient that she gets disarmed, put into the center of the chamber, and, oh, look, there's a holocron. Kylo's about to give her the death blow, and then he's frozen. Luke's son, Tyus, appears from the shadows, holding Kylo in stasis with the Force. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, it's Luke's son, whatever. But a, an eight-year-old boy holding the Jedi killer in stasis? I don't know. I, I like the idea of it. Luke's child, right? Like, steps in. But why didn't Luke do that. Like, why is it that Tyus, an eight-year-old boy, it's just kind of strange. Luke's daughter, Key, jumps up and punches a red button on the wall, locking both Kylo and Ray in a force field. Okay. So then Kylo's like, you know, I can still kill her inside of here. Are you going to leave me in here with her corpse? Um. So then Ray grabs the holocron which again, just miraculously just appears. It smokes and flashes, and um, while Kylo is fighting the, the stasis, and he's slowly bringing his lightsaber down, which I don't know how much I like that either. Either you're like frozen in stasis or you're not. This whole thing of like... Uh, uh, so then Ray flickers in and out of existence, but then she disappears. And Kylo's dumbfounded. Um, Luke smiles. You always were gullible, Kylo. No wonder Snoke so easily turned you. Now you're our prisoner for eternity. Uh, Poe and Finn get to the chamber, and then Luke tells them they've beaten Kylo, but Ray is gone. Okay, so this brings up a few things. Where the hell did Ray go? And I'm okay with if she has training, if she's special, and she. Not necessarily her, but let's say like Luke or Yoda, so in tune with the Force, and they have a holocron that they could maybe somehow teleport or... I don't know if teleport's the right word, but somehow kind of cross planes or something through the Force. I'm not crazy about it, but I could live with it. But one, why would Ray know how to do this? She's way too inexperienced. <sighs> Two, the holocron is just way too convenient that it's there. Um, and then the other thing that I notice here is the way that Luke is speaking to Kylo. You always were gullible, Kylo. No wonder Snoke so easily turned you. Now you're our prisoner for eternity. Is that an uncle speaking to his nephew? No, it's not. So even if Kylo is evil, even if Kylo is who he is, if he's indeed Leia's son, his nephew, you're not going to talk to him that way. You're going to say, Kylo, I'm sorry, I failed you. Uh, you know, I hate that I have to do this, but I have to keep you imprisoned here because you've gone off the freaking rails, dude. You know what I mean? Like it would have been a totally different tone and different dialogue if there was a connection between Luke and Kylo, if there was actually, uh, you know, he was actually his nephew, etc. So this is going to show me, because remember, again, this is before The Force Awakens came out. This is the, sh the treatment for Episode 8, 
but this was written before episode seven even came out. So they already had this kind of pre-plan. So to me, not only this part, but other parts of this treatment show me that Kala was not related to Leia, Han, or Luke. He was just this Jedi killer. Back on Snoke's planet, uh, a Leia strike team arrives. Which again, why would you only send five bounty hunters or a little strike team? Why isn't the entire resistance going there? They get into a fight, a firefight with Snoke's royal guards. Most of them are killed. Uh, one bounty hunter makes the lower levels to a laboratory. He um, sees something displayed in a glass case. He takes a holographic picture of it and sends it to General Leia. Just as the transmission goes through, Erg, who is the uh, Kilmit Erg, is the bounty hunter. His neck is broken. As his body falls to the floor, we see Snoke standing behind him, his crippled hand extended. Akbar receives the image and runs it towards General Leia's quarter. She looks at it, mouth agape, and says, It's a severed hand, my brother's severed hand. The question, what are they using it for? Okay, so now we know that from the beginning, they were going to explore something with cloning. And now we know where Fauni Filoni got Grogu and why the whole thing came about of cloning Grogu. Because, by the way, for anyone that foolishly thinks otherwise, The Mandalorian is about to connect to the sequel trilogy. It is, they've shown several examples of this, and it's so freaking obvious. So be prepared, because they literally took Grogu's blood for Snoke. All right? Don't be deceived, because the connection is coming. And in a little bit here, I'm going to show you something that Favreau said. Anyways, um... So they had Luke's hand. Why? Because of the DNA. That was the only DNA they could get of Luke. Therefore, they want to clone him or his force abilities or something about him. But again, this shows the lack of knowledge of Disney. You cannot clone force users. It doesn't work. We know this. Why? Because if it did work, Palpatine wouldn't have bothered with Jango Fett's. He would have cloned 10,000 Darth Mauls and or 10,000 Count Dooku's, okay? It's not going to waste time with clones. He would have had an army of Darth Mauls terrorizing the Jedi and the entire galaxy. You cannot clone Force users. I've discussed this in the past. It cannot happen. If it could happen, for generations, Sith and or Jedi would have been cloning Force users. You can't do it. So the whole Baby Yoda thing is just stupid, but whatever. That's what it's going to. It's going to the sequel trilogy, so prepare yourself. All right, and then we got the little epilogue here. Which I'll just go ahead and read because it's so short. Epilogue, Ray appears back in the Sith Acropolis on the Platinum Throne. 300 generations ago in the Old Republic. Her eyes glow red. Many loyal subjects bow before her and chant. She's, vis she's visibly shaken. Where is she? How did she get here? Rey is trapped in the past. She is now Talston Light. The end. Okay. So, when Rey used the holocron to flicker in and out and change planes or whatever, she ended up back... 300 generations as Tolston Light. I like the fact that she's conscious of the fact that she went back and that she's Tolston Light, but really she's Ray. And she's like, wait a minute, why am I, you know, Tolston Light? It's not like she just went back and like, oh, I'm Tolston Light and the cycle repeats. She is aware. So I think that's neat. Um, what is the resolution of this? I don't know. I don't know how you would get around Ray being 300 years back and she was a Sith witch. So I don't know. What is she going to do? Turn good? Turn evil? 
it's very hard to say. They could go a lot of ways with this, but it's very, it causes a bunch of problems too. 300 years past, 300 generations, not even 300 years, 300 generations back in the old Republic, her eyes are glowing red. Um, and she's tossed in light. So I don't know. That complicates the issue. And who knows where they would have gone with that one. That sounds kind of messy. But it could have been cool. It could have been. She gets trapped in the past. It could have been. She had to figure out something with the holocron to get back. Although only Jedi can open Jedi holocrons. And only Sith can open Sith holocrons. So if she was a Jedi using a Jedi holocron to go back. And now she's. Tolstan Light, a Sith witch, she probably couldn't activate the holocron. Now, Disney, as they don't care, it probably wouldn't matter. She would just use the holocron, which is a wayfinder in the Disney movies, but it's really a holocron because we've all known about holocrons for, I don't know, 40 freaking years. So, who knows? Um, very interesting, Ray, going back in time, 300 generations. And she's a Sith witch. Again, I don't think that this is perfect. There's a lot of things that could be changed or added or whatever. I will say, if this is what we got, it's a thousand times better than The Last Jedi or anything in the sequel trilogy. I would have much rather seen this. Luke is respected. Luke is powerful. Luke is wise. Rey must learn. Rey goes through training. Ray is very humble and obviously not ready, so she has to go to Luke. Ahsoka, I'm not happy about it at all, but at least there's some sort of explanation. Not, not just she's there because I'm Dave Filoni and want her to be there. Uh, okay. Let's look at something here. Do it this way, just a moment. This was September 11th, 2019. Not my Star Wars existed. I was uh, very vigilant of things at that time, but I didn't catch this till just recently. Um, and it's very interesting. Just a moment. This, um, I don't know if you guys see it, but there's this little video ad. I got to wait till it ends till I can close it. It's a pain in the ass. Okay. September 11th, 2019, John Favreau on whether Thrawn, Mar Jade could be in the Mandalorian. Okay, this, so this is last year, uh, just like two months after the Mandalorian premiered, season one. There's not much here. It's a pretty short little thing, but there's something that John says. Mara Jade, a sarcastic smuggler and fighter who eventually marries Luke Skywalker. Someone didn't read the EU because that's not what Mara Jade is. Mara Jade is the Emperor's Hand. Sarcastic smuggler and fighter? She's literally a Sith. She's the Emperor's Hand. Whatever. Uh, okay. So I'm going to read you this little paragraph, which is really the only thing that's here. But what matters so that you understand because people, you know, foolishly think that John Favreau is going to save Star Wars and that these guys are on our side and that Dave Filoni cares. And OK, September 11th, 2019, John Favreau. I don't want to talk about anything that might be fun for people to discover. So Favreau says we do have conversations. We do have conversations. Part of what's fun to see if we could merge the two worlds of the original trilogy the prequels, the sequels, 
the Clone Wars and what's been considered canon up to this point and what's been considered part of Legends. I think this show offers an opportunity to bring in all of those elements. So no matter what your flavor of Star Wars ice cream you like, there will be something to enjoy. But you're asking the right questions. Okay, so John Favreau, the people that think he doesn't like the sequel trilogy and doesn't want anything to do with it and that he's anti-Kathleen and that he's the savior. He literally says it. Fun to see if we could merge the worlds of the OT, PT, and a fucking piece of dumpster fire trash train wreck sequel trilogy made by Disney. Plus the Clone War cartoons. Plus what was canon and legends. Okay? So John Favreau, people seem to have it twisted and think, well, he's great and he knows Star Wars and he loves it. No, he doesn't. What he is doing, and if you guys pay attention, go watch the Disney Gallery. He literally says, what we are doing is fan service. I'm going through all Star Wars material, video games, comics, movies, books, and I'm taking stuff from all of it to sucker you into buying into the Mandalorian, to being like, oh, remember this? Remember that? We just saw the episode with the tank pilots, right? The Juggernaut. <coughs> Ahsoka. You know, all these things are to suck you in. It's not about continuity. It's not about canon. It's not about caring about Star Wars. It's about what's going to bring your ass in. That's why they brought in Luke Skywalker this last episode. Not because John Favreau and Dave Filoni give a shit about Luke Skywalker, because I need to remind everyone that Dave Filoni was the consultant on the rise of Skywalker and the entire sequel trilogy. So half of the shit that they did was per Dave Filoni. Okay? It's not that they care about Star Wars and The Mandalorian. It's about what they're doing is playing it safe and throwing out a 10 million member berries. But the goal here, and he says it very clearly, if we could merge the worlds of the OT, the prequels, the sequels, plus the Clone Wars and what was canon and legends. Okay, so John Favreau does not give a fuck about you or Star Wars or anything. He cares about getting money and making the Mandalorian show as successful as possible. And he clearly spells it out that they're tying it all in together. So. Disney, I'm afraid, has no plan to wipe out the sequel trilogy. Kathleen Kennedy is not going anywhere. And Mandalorian, well, you can just expect more member berries. Because it's never going to be canon. It's never going to be respectful to the OT. And furthermore, it's going to start connecting the sequel trilogy. That, get it through your head, guys. This is why they wanted Grogu's blood for Snoke for Palpatine cloning people so that John Favreau and phony fucking baloney baloney can now justify and say, but you, you could clone he force people because we have baby Yoda and that's how Palpatine came. That's exactly what they're doing. It's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to justify the rise of Skywalker. So whatever your flavor of Star Wars ice cream, not authentic one of a kind, real Star Wars or real ice cream, but whatever flavor you like, even if it's crappy, half fast gas station ice cream, whatever you like, well, there it is. You're going to have it. All right. So please don't come to me with Dave Filoni and John Favreau and blah, 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 because Favreau, Filoni, and Kathy are all very friendly. And they all are working on the same plan. And furthermore, just a moment. Force Awaken. Let me see if I have that thing on hand because there was something else I actually have from Peter Cushion. It's not that. Just a moment. I might have another little tidbit for you guys here. Where did I put that?
think it's here. Just a moment. Okay, I think it's here. Just a second. Yeah, we do. I think it's here. If you're trying, you're holding back. There's self doubt. I'll play it for you guys. I just got to find it real quick. It's available if you want, but as a storyteller, you have a challenge and responsibility. I mean, it's like where we were going to do. Okay, I can't find it right now, but I'm pretty damn sure it's this video, which was exclusive by the behind the scenes look uh, at the Empire Strikes Back with Dave Filoni. It's on the Star Wars um, YouTube. The point that I wanted to show you. Because Filoni doesn't really say anything of substance, but he does say a line where he's like, um, I'm going to see if I can find it still, because I really want to show you guys. But he basically says, oh, I get to work with all these amazing people, and we're all on the same page, and we love Star Wars, and blah, blah, blah. And he's in a picture with John Favreau, and guess who? Kathleen Kennedy. And this is recent. This isn't an old. This just came out like days ago. Okay, so people that think that Kathleen Kennedy isn't on the Mandalorian set, or that Dave Filoni and they're a different faction, and they don't talk, and the, and then she doesn't have any influence. And I'm very sorry to, to to tell you guys, I have tons of pictures and video clips of Dave Filoni with Kathleen Kennedy, and this is days ago, not weeks. Not months, not before The Mandalorian Season 2. This was literally days ago. I'm trying to find it. Because if you know me, I like to show the shit that I'm talking Come on, where are you? I have a feeling it's right Alts around. From making the first season, you've done so many episodes. Of course, now that I want to find this crap, I can't, right?
anyways, I'm like 95% sure that this was the where I just saw it. Um, again, I literally saw this days ago. Maybe it's here. The live action space is something that I became interested in directly because of my work with George. I hadn't really aspired to be a live action director in my career. I was just really focused on animation and learning that craft and art. But working with George, you know, he gave me a lot of confidence to say, well, maybe this is something I could do. I didn't know if it would ever happen. You know, you need some. Better ah. I think I found it. People, whether it's there we go. You're going to do and what you Just a moment. I found it. <laughs> oh, not my Star Wars would never lie to you. Never ever will I lie to you. If I tell you Dave Filoni's a piece of shit, it's because he's a piece of shit. And I'm going to show you. Hopefully you guys can see this. Let me see. Yep, you should be seeing it. Okay, so listen and watch. Look at what you see. Could bring to it. You have to have a team of people. Uh, hold on. Animation, live action. That are hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I need to share auto audio. So just a second. Uh, maybe it was. Okay, let me know if you don't have audio, although what he says isn't that important. I want you to look. That's the main thing. Look at what you see here. And you tell me, and, and we're going to look I'm at it. I'm trying to make this awesome story happen. Right, people at every uh, step of my career at Lucasfilm. So now that we're coming to the end of season two, like obvious. Okay, just a moment. It's right around here. To make, and you need to be surrounded by the right people. It's not just about what you're going to do and what you can bring to it. You have to have a team. Who is this with the big old smile? Okay. This is days ago, guys. Favreau. Phony baloney. Fucking Filoni. Taika. The Wicked Witch of Star Wars. Bryce Dallas Howard. Fuma uh, you are. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce his name. So no disrespect to him because he's actually done a good job, whoever this photographer is. But as you can see, the three musketeers... The three stooges right here, all smiley and happy. Favreau, Filoni Baloney, and Kathleen Kennedy. Now, if you want to question me, let's go to... Oh, I love this stuff. Just a moment. Just a moment. Okay. See this Star Wars YouTube channel. Videos. You see right here, exclusive behind the scenes look at the Empire Strikes Back and Dave Filoni talks to Mandalorian. Three days ago, that is what I just showed you. Three days ago. So don't tell me that Kathleen Kennedy isn't part of the Mandalorian or that Dave Filoni is our savior and gonna be here and that Favreau cares about Star Wars. Bullshit. They're all snug as a bug on the same team. And we're going to continue with the same nonsensical Star Wars. This is all going, all paths 
lead to the sequel trilogy. Okay, so all of you getting excited over Luke Skywalker's little cameo in The Mandalorian, yeah, it was cool. I'm happy to see Luke, but that's what we should have had from the beginning. It's too late for all that. So short of Disney publicly apologizing, publicly admitting that they fucked up, and publicly saying, bye-bye sequel trilogy, you're gone, out of existence, then what Luke did is stupid. Nobody cares because he just becomes an asshole. And obviously he fails Grogu because Grogu either gets lost or killed by Kylo Ren. So Luke's a failure. So what happened to, I'm going to protect him with my life and it's important for him. If he's so important, he's a Yoda species and extra powerful with the force. And Luke is the most powerful Jedi in the history of Jedi. And he's training Grogu, a Yoda species. Then how come Yoda's Grogu isn't in the sequel? Oh, that's right. Because we just made him up like two months ago. And we didn't think about continuity. We don't care about canon. We'll just make up characters and throw them in. Okay. I I'm gonna I'm gonna show this again because it's just it's too good. It's too good. I I love it when people try to tell me Filoni's so great, he's gonna save Star Wars. Is he now? <laughs> Is he now? Is he going to save Star Wars, kids? Well, suck on this. You tell me if Dave Filoni and John Favreau are who you want running Star Wars. There she is. The queen all smiles with her boys. Okay? Her little pawns. She's not even like fake. I mean, she's like genuinely happy smiling. <laughs> oh. Dave Filoni, he's so great. He knows all about Star Wars. He's going to save us. John Favreau, he loves Star Wars. He's on our side. Mm -hmm. They're on the side of money. They're on the side of Disney. They're on the side of we get to make Star Wars shit. They are not on George Lucas' side. They're not on your side. They're not on Star Wars' side. Because none of the shit that we have gotten would exist if this was about Star Wars. If this was about respecting George Lucas. You would not have three days ago these fucks hanging out smiling. Now, I'm not saying this picture was taken three days ago, okay? This could have been taken a month ago, six months ago. My guess is this is uh, when they wrapped season two, okay? Might even be the end of season one, but that was just a year ago. Either way, this video just came out three days ago. This picture is recent, and it's not the only one. I have other pictures and clips of Kathleen hanging out with the boys. So don't be fooled to think that this is all going to go away and the sequel trilogy is going away and Kathleen's done. We just saw her at the freaking Investor Day announcing 10 new shows. So <laughs> Kathleen ain't going nowhere. I hate it. I'm not happy about it. I'm not trying to defend it. I'm just being real. And here's the proof. So when you got... Dave Filoni, like I showed you in the last stream, saying, I don't care about canon. Canon doesn't matter. You got Kathleen, who we all know what she's all about, and we just saw her, and she's still around. And then you got Fabra. I just showed you the quote that he's like, we're going to connect all of it, even the sequel trilogy. We want it all to be different ice cream, so all you suckers will buy it. And then you got, three days ago, the three of them hanging out. Right. My, my case is closed. I rest, Your Honor. Sounds like sentence to death to me. There's no there's no debate. There's nothing to talk about there. Pretty cut and dry. So, hopefully that was entertaining. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Because I love, I just love people telling me, Dave Filoni, he's the bestest. He knows what he's doing. He, he cares about Star Wars. He's the savior. Mm -hmm. 
didn't save her all right. Save her of his ass. Save her of his paycheck. Oh, boy. All right. Well, as far as the script goes, that's pretty much all I have to say on it, all I have on it. Um, I will be doing another one, something in the vein of that. I don't want to give it away, but there's another treatment floating around, let's just say. <laughs> so I will be covering that soon. The Empire Project. Um, just a quick update. I'm running out of days in December and in 2020. So the all the problems with the Mandalorian Chapter 2, the child will be pushed into the new year. Um, just because I don't have time. I don't have the time to edit that. Plus this and other stuff going on. So I have to finish up the Empire Project. So probably the last video for 2020 will be the Empire Project. Most likely it will be on the 31st. It will be something in the vein of the uh, episode 8 narration video. It's going to be better. It's going to be far more interesting. It's going to have a lot more action and scenes and other people's voices doing the characters. It's going to be a whole other level, but something in that vein. Me narrating uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Kind of, sort of, something in that vein, to give you an idea. So, at this point, um, the Mandalorian issue will be pushed till, I mean, unless I happen to finish up fast and I have time, but most likely that will be in the new year, first or second week of January. And the priority right now is to get the Empire Project finished for 2020. And right now, I'm looking at on the 31st is when I will premiere it. So, um, as far as this live stream is concerned, I'm going to end it because I don't want to start talking about a bunch of other stuff and take away from this topic. I notice I do that sometimes on certain live streams and that's fine, but I want to end this one so that it's about this topic and then I can go on to the next live stream. I am thinking about doing another live stream tonight because I've got a bunch of other stuff. If some of you will remember the last Thursday, I said I was going to come on last Friday and then a bunch of stuff happened, a bunch of new news, life stuff, just been busy, and it kept getting laid on me, and I didn't do the stream, although I was meaning to. So I am considering in probably like an hour or something, maybe doing another stream, and I'll talk about a bunch of other stuff that I have. Um, in particular, we were going to talk about the Investor Day. So I might do another stream here in a, about an hour. I'm going to take a quick break. But I want to close this one off so that we stick on the topic of the episode eight treatment. So uh, I appreciate everyone that came in. It wasn't too many people this time, but there was a few of you here. I appreciate it. Appreciate the likes. I see I got a dislike. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, that investor stream, man, that thing got 5,000 views. Like it had almost 2,000 views live. And it's now at like 5,000 views. That. Phew, most of my streams have like a hundred and something people. I don't know what was going on with that one, but that one got massive amount of views. Anyways, so there's a bunch of little stuff we can talk about. Um, the Investor Day and some other little things. Um, also the Mandalorian. I said I was going to talk about the Mandalorian so we could talk about um, the last two episodes of the Mandalorian. So I have a bunch of little cool things we could talk about and discuss. Um, but I figure I want to end this one. So again, I stay on the topic of the episode eight and finish it out at a nice two and a half hours. And um, pretty sure like 98% in about an hour, I'm going to go eat something, get my bearings, take a quick break, stretch out, stretch out. And I'll set up another stream. Uh, what time is it? Five, th oh, it's five 30. It's early. It's dark as hell outside. It looks like it's nine o'clock at night. So I'm thinking in about an hour, I'll jump back on um, and we can talk about other loose stuff and general stuff. So, okay, I'll stop blabbering. Um, I appreciate anyone that came into the stream. Please like and subscribe. Uh, plenty of stuff to see on the channel. And um, please leave comments. What do you guys think of this script? 
I know that some people are going to be resistant. They're going to say, this sucks. This is stupid. I would have rather had The Last Jedi. That's just being ignorant because we all know. A three-year-old knows. You look at this, and this is a thousand times more cohesive, a thousand times more respectful. It's more, I mean, it's like a Star Wars story. Do you particularly like the story and where it's going and what the events? Well, maybe not. But you, you, you can't lie. You can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to me. We all know that this is much better than The Last Jedi or anything that the Disney trilogy did. So between this treatment, the Duel of the Fates treatment, the other treatment that I'll t get to soon enough here, um, we could have had a much better Star Wars. Would it have been George Lucas, uh, you know, on that level? No. It never will be without George Lucas being involved, but it would have been a much higher quality product. And most importantly, whether you like the story or the characters or what it was going, it respected Luke and the franchise. Um, Han at this point was dead, but at least, you know, they have a funeral. They acknowledge him. Did you notice how like nobody talked about Han anymore? It was just like, okay, Han's dead and we'll just keep going. <laughs> I mean, so, anyways, please leave your comments. Let me know what you thought of the stream and what you think of this story treatment. I personally will endorse it with, this is what we should have got. Not to say that this is what I would have written. Not to say that this is the ultimate draft, that we couldn't have made more revisions and added or changed or fixed or expounded, by all means. But if I got to take the nonsense that I saw in the theaters, as opposed to what I've read on the Duel of Fates, this treatment and the other treatment, I'm taking the other stuff all day long. It's at least trying to be Star Wars. It's at least trying to respect the characters in the story. But when you got KK, JJ, Ryan, Phony Filoni, and even Lawrence Kasdan saying, oh, I don't care about the canon. We just want to write the story we want to write. Of course it was doomed to fail. <laughs> because the only person that really truly ever cared about the canon was George Lucas. And the, the original fans. Because even fans nowadays don't care about or understand the canon either. So, it is what it is. Um, let me see what else I got. Any little tidbits for you guys. All right, I gotta, I'll head out with a couple little video clips just for the fun. And I'll um, close the stream. And again, I'll, in about an hour, I'll probably, most likely, like very, very likely, I'll do another stream. So either way, Empire Project is coming very soon. And the year, in case I don't see any of you, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. But I will... Um, stream again in a little bit and i will probably do one more stream before the years are over but we'll see all right guys so let me know what you think of this treatment i'm going to jump off so i can close up this stream and i will see most some of you at least in about an hour or so i'll leave you with a few clips <laughs> for the fun and uh thanks again for being here may the force be with you and i will talk to you guys soon and, uh, you know, like I just showed you, you know, don't forget, I've shown you several pieces of proof. This is all going to the sequel trilogy. Kathleen Kennedy's right there with her boys, smiling and laughing. So don't be fooled. Don't buy into this crap. Mandalorian's cute and it's fun and all. But at the end of the day, it's not that great of a show. And it's leading right to the sequel trilogy. So don't get too excited about Luke Skywalker because they're just going to shit all over him. All right. So thanks again. See you guys soon. May the force be with you. Thank you, uh, Righteous. You think they're they're going to to um, connect the sequel trilogy? Yes. I, I don't know when you came in, but uh, I did show proof of this. So look back at the replay. You've got...
Favreau saying he wants to connect all the universe, including the sequel trilogy. You got Filoni saying he doesn't care about canon, doesn't matter. You got Lawrence Kasdan saying canon, doesn't matter. You got Mark Martin saying it's all fake anyways. It's not really canon anyways. So then you got, I just showed a picture of Kathleen Kennedy, Dave Filoni, and John Favreau hanging out, all smiles. So yes, it is going to straight connect to the sequel trilogy. That's what the, this is the point of Grogu. It wasn't to be cute. It wasn't to, to have a little partner. It was all about getting his blood for Snoke. Well, to, he served two purposes. One, validate Ray with force healing. Two, get Snoke's blood. That's what Grogu is all about. So, sorry if you're Baby Yoda fans. Sorry if you bought into that garbage. I didn't. I will always see right through Disney. I do not trust them. I know better. And until they have destroyed their nonsense, gotten it out of there, and reestablished things, and sh taken over time to prove of us in good faith that they're going to do the right thing, then I'll think about, think about starting to give them a chance. But right now, you can flash Luke Skywalker in my face all you want. Who cares? He's going to end up on Acto in a few years and be an asshole. So it does nothing for me. <sighs> yep, they're going to piss everyone off. Absolutely. Um, well, Righteous, I don't know how much you heard, but I'm going to close out this stream so I stay on the topic of the stream. But in about an hour, I'm going to open up a new stream. I'll be talking about Mandalorian. I'll be talking about the Investor Day, and we'll have like a general Star Wars discussion. So try to, yeah, she does need to go. Absolutely, she needs to go. But um, hey, I would love to see you back in about an hour. So I'll be opening up a new stream if you would like to um, come into that one. How would they connect? Well, like I just said, they're going to, um, you know, the blood, they justified, Ray, you know, etc. So anyways, I'll see you guys in about an hour. I'm very awake and excited and ready to talk some Star Wars. And I've got a bunch of goodies. So see you in an hour. All right. I'm going to grab something to eat, stretch. And uh, we'll reconvene on a general Star Wars discussion. And we'll talk a lot about the men and Lauren. I got pictures and stuff to talk about. So, all right, guys, I'm going to leave you with some video clips and I'm out of here. I will see you in a little bit. Thank you again, Maurice. D as always. Vicky, I don't know if I lost you, but thank you so much for coming in. Uh, Obi-Wan. I don't know if my, that's my usual Obi-Wan or is this somebody with a different because the avatar is different. So I don't know if that's the usual Obi-Wan, but either way, thanks for coming in, Obi-Wan. Um, Shift 678. Cyan uh, Mac, or Cyan Mac. And I think that was everybody that commented. So thanks again. <laughs> Jaggerit, bye, bye. I will see you guys in a little bit. I'm going to leave you some clips and um, see you soon. About an hour. All right, take care. May the force be with you. You two were really the brainchilds behind the story. Uh, how much did you guys look at the extended universe and the extremely large canon of books that have been written around the Star Wars universe when you decided to make this? Or was it more looking at Return of the Jedi and just figuring out how you guys feel it should have gone? Hey, you want to take it? Um, I think it had more to do with uh, Jedi and the continuation of, you know, four, five, and six. This is seven. Um, I think, you know, we were aware, we're respectful of the canon, but we really wanted to tell a story that interested us and delighted us, and we weren't, didn't really want any um, rules and parameters particularly. We just said, well, we can do anything we want with this story. What would be the most fun to, thing to do? on this page and the next page and the page after that. And that was sort of the guiding principle, I think, more than the canon or anything that had come before. We have a